annoying to say. All right, um, week nine hangout. We only have one more of these. And then summer can really start. Andrew, dude, you're late. Yep. <laughs> well, better late than never. Yep. Um, all right, Darlene, let me take a little roll here, William. All right. Um, so there's, there are three things that we want to do tonight, uh, or, or at least three things that I want to do tonight. Um, the first is talk about final exam options. Um, no, the final exam is not optional. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> Darn. Um, uh, the second thing is I want to talk a little bit about labor market economics, kind of give you the high-level overview. Um, and the third is to talk about the economics of the environment. Um, next week, we will review for the final, and we will talk about the economics of international trade, um, as well as answer any questions that you have. So uh, don't worry. We're going to talk about that stuff. Okay. Um, it turns out that... Um, I am going to be out of town next Thursday, which is the scheduled date for the final exam. So um, I'm going to give you guys some options. Um, you can take it next Thursday in the econ house, ideally in the morning. Um, the downside of that is that I have to be out of town, and so you won't be able to ask me questions, at least not directly. I suppose you could text me. Um, Option number two is take it the following Monday, July 29th, in the Econ House, anytime between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., basically. Pretty much any time. Um, I will be there. I'll be there to answer your questions. Um, I will just hang out all day long. Uh, option three, and this is particularly for folks who are not spending the summer in Fredericksburg, um, is you can take it when you come back to school in August. Um, ideally, or, uh, ideally by the last, by, by the end of the first week. We you know, don't want this to, to, um, to carry on. Kevin, you made it. We were worried. I'm sure you were. Okay. Um, whenever you choose to take the final exam, you have to tell me so that I know that you're coming. And you, the deadline for this is next week's Hangout. So, you know, whichever the options you want, that's fine. Um, but let me know by next week. I'm Wait, sorry, so I just, I hear option one. What was option one again? Sorry, Kevin, you missed it. No problem. No. Uh, option one was come next Thursday when I will not be in town. Okay, but there, but uh, I do have a colleague who's going to be there, and we'll give you the exam. Um, but you won't be able to ask me questions directly, so that's the downside. Option two is Monday anytime. Option three is in August when you get back to school. All right, Ashley, you're hiding in the corner as usual. Hi, sorry, it's my phone because I can't use my computer. No, it's Zoom. okay. It's okay, but you were literally at the end of my screen and you know only half of your face is showing so <laughs> not I don't think I've ever seen Ashley below her nose <laughs> yeah well I've only seen from the nose up <laughs> I'm sorry guys no no it's okay we just thought you were you know hiding something I'm always in weird spots every time uh, no, that's okay on Wednesday, that's so. okay um you know she's hiding her smile that's what it was <laughs> Okay. I thought it was like Bane from Dark Knight Rises, maybe. I didn't know. No. No, that was not what I was thinking. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, the economics of labor markets. We'll start with a basic question that I always pose in my face-to-face -face class. Why do firms hire workers? Produce products. Because they're, they want to do you a favor, right? They're all about helping their employees out. That's their objective, right? Kevin? No. No, the answer is an employer hires you for your productivity. They need you for what you can produce. Your work literally brings in revenues to the firm. And that's an important point. Okay, the more revenues that you bring into the firm, 
the more the firm is going to be willing to pay you. Okay, so we can formalize that in the first rule of labor markets, which says a firm, and just listen and then I'll repeat it for you. A firm will never pay more for a worker than the value of their marginal productivity. A firm will never pay more for a worker than the value of their marginal productivity. It's literally what you're worth to the firm in dollars. Sam, did you have an equipment failure? Yeah, Pen. <laughs> okay, let me give you an example. Suppose you produce six widgets per hour on the assembly line and your employer can sell those widgets for $2 each. How much are you worth to the firm? $12. You are worth six times two equals $12 per hour. Literally, that's what you're worth to the firm. Your employer will pay you up to, but no more than $12 per hour. So what you're worth determines in large part what you're gonna get paid. At least it puts a limit on it. Okay. Um, why does, uh, why did Michael Jordan earn more playing basketball than I do? He's worth more. Um, you can't dunk. <laughs> well, there's that too. He literally would bring people into the seats and I never would. Right. So, so he literally brought more money into the firm and that's why he got paid more. Okay. Everything else in labor markets is a detail. It all comes from the fact that firms pay you based on what you're worth to them. Okay, does anybody have questions about, uh, about labor markets or stuff that I didn't talk about about labor markets? Because there was a lot there. There was stuff about monopsonies and oligopsonies and unions and... Sounds like somebody dropped in, except I don't see anybody. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, for firms that are nonprofit, um, when they're, uh, I think they talked about them a little bit, but when they're losing money, should they act like for-profit firms in order to get back to break even? Um, in what way? What are you thinking? Um, it, you know, the, the way for, is they don't pay you more than you're worth, like you just said. Right. right. And they would, if you're um, not generating as much, then they would let you go, right? For a sure. profit maximum. Um, if, however, it's also the case that in, in this day and age where, um, where American firms are fairly short-sighted, they want to make their, their numbers each quarter, um, it's quite possible that firms will lay you off even if you're even if they're making money on you, just to reduce their labor costs. So it looks good to gotcha. stock. I was thinking about the, the nonprofit firms. I forget exactly okay. what exactly they're- Think exactly about Mary Washington, think about UMW, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we, o we, we only ever make our budget after the fact by adjusting things, right? Oh. So, so uh, there are certainly things that we can do on the cost side to keep our costs within our budget. Um, but um, UMW is kind of like agriculture, that there's a season, and once you're in the season, there's not a lot you can do on the, on the revenue side. You have the students that you have. Um, so, so it, it certainly is more challenging, I think. Okay. Other questions? This is more in, in the next module in income distribution. You just mentioned the, the quarters. Um, in the income, they mentioned quintile, which I understand what that means. Uh, it means fifth, fifth. But yeah. I've never, I've never heard that. I've always heard quarta. Is that an economic? No. Um, no. No. Um, uh, one thing, uh, uh, economists tend to use quintiles because there's a middle one, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So, so the middle quintile 
is the average income or includes the average income, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, uh, you know, there's no hard and fast rule that you have to do that, but that's just what we do. Okay. So um, I'm not asking, uh, um, on the final, there won't be any questions specifically from that module. I was gonna make that announcement next time. Um, but certainly on the, the first labor module, that's where the, the good stuff is. So speaking of that, it, it's going to, that's 13 income distribution. Um, are the, the rest on the outline going to be on it? I guess mm -hmm. just not. Yes. Okay. So it's just that one is the only yep. one that, yep. okay, gotcha. Okay, let's go on and talk about, um, the next module, which is the economics of the environment. Um, the takeaway for this is that economics, or sorry, pollution, environmental problems generally, are an economic problem, but also a problem of the legal system. Um, and th those things um, are not independent of one another. Okay, so the, e the economic part of the problem derives from the legal part of the problem. All right, um, so let's start by talking about the difference between public and private goods. Public and private goods are easy to confuse um, because in the case of public goods, it's not what it sounds like. Okay, so what's the difference between public goods and private goods. A public good is non-rivalrous and non-excludable. Uh, yes. Whereas a private good is not. What does that mean in English? Non-rivalrous means that like if, uh, for example, if you consume it, I can consume it as well. Yep. And non-excludable means like at, it doesn't come at a great cost to make it available to everyone. It's not excluded from some, some certain person. Okay. That's sense. Private goods are goods where the person who pays for them derives all of the benefits, or their family does. Okay? And that if you consume a private good, no one else can get it, can consume the same private good. That's the non exclude or the um, non rival part. Okay? So an apple is a private good. You buy the apple, you eat it, you get the benefits of it, nobody else does. Okay, public goods are the other extreme case. Public goods aren't defined as goods that are produced by the government, though that happens to generally be the case. We call them public goods for an entirely different reason, okay? And that is, um, the benefits overwhelmingly would go to people who don't pay for them, okay? So what's, what we're talking about here is externalities, spillover effects, something that you buy, I benefit from. The three people whose yards back up to my backyard all have fences around their yards which means that I only had to fence in a little bit on each side of my house, right? So, so I benefited from their, their good, right? So that's, a, that's an example of a positive externality. A positive externality means the marginal benefit to everyone exceeds the marginal benefit to the person who bought it and consumed it, okay? Or in econ speak, the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit. Marginal private benefit is the consumer and the marginal social benefit is everyone, including the consumer, but also anyone who's affected. Okay, so we have three kinds of goods. We have pure private goods, we have pure public goods, and in the middle, we have positive externalities, which are semi-public, semi-private, 
okay? Some are closer to private goods, some are closer to public goods, okay? But in all cases, if it's not a pure public good, then the marginal social benefits exceed the marginal private benefits because there are positive spillovers here. Okay, now the problem with public goods is they tend to be big ticket items, like national defense is the classic example, right? Who among us is willing to pay the Defense Department's budget to be protected? The answer is probably no one. None of us has the money, even though collectively we're all gonna benefit by having national defense, right? So this is what's known um, as a collective action problem meaning no one wants to pay for it, even though we know that we'll benefit for it once it's available. So the solution to that problem is government makes us pay for it through taxes, okay, and then provides it for everyone, okay? So the bottom line here is that if government didn't provide public goods, then we wouldn't have them, okay? Because no one would be willing to pay the full price. Second, externality goods suffer from the same problem, but to a lesser degree, okay? Meaning um, something that has a positive externality will be underprovided by the market, okay? So, with a public good, the market provides zero. With a, with a private good, the market provides the right amount. In other words, it meets everyone's needs. With an externality good, it, un, it doesn't provide enough to meet everyone's needs. Okay. So what this means graphically is when you have externality goods, positive externalities, you're gonna have two marginal benefit curves. You're gonna have a lower marginal private benefit curve and a higher marginal social benefit curve. Um, and um, private individuals or profit maximizing firms are gonna supply the, the amount where the marginal private benefit equals the marginal private cost that's allocatively inefficient because allocative inefficiency requires that the market supply or that we were able to consume where the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. And that won't happen with externality goods. Okay, the graphs are all explained in the module. So um, um, hopefully you can figure that out once you look at the graphs. Okay, now negative externalities like pollution are a similar problem, but on the other side. A negative externality is when your actions adversely affect someone else. Okay, um, so you're running the firm, you take the pollution that your production process generates and you toss it in the Rappahannock River where it moves out of sight, out of mind, not your problem anymore, right? However, it's gonna affect the fishing and the re recreational activities and maybe the drinking water of downstream, right? So the costs to society of the firm doing business are actually greater than the cost that they bear. Okay. Um, Any questions about that? All right. Now, um, the reason the 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 reason why we have externality problems of the type that I just described is because of improperly specified property rights. This is the legal side of the story. What does property mean? What does ownership mean? 
if you own a piece of land, what does that mean? What does, what does the ownership give you? It means that you inherit all the benefits and the costs. Basically, yes. What it means is that you, you can use that property how you want, assuming that you stay within external guidelines like zoning and things like that. Um, or you can let other people use your property and you can dictate the terms under which they can use the property. So like if it's a piece of a land, you can rent it out if you want. Okay. Um, so private property is property that's owned by a, uh, an individual or a group of well-defined individuals. Um, the opposite of private property is called common property or public property. Um, I picked up a hitchhiker one time in upstate New York. Really? <laughs> well, this was decades ago, and he was, he was a sad, sad looking kid. Um, it was on I-81, just to tell you what was going on. Um, and he had a backpack. Um, he had just graduated from high school. And he was going to tour the United States. And he'd never been out of his small town before. So um, I asked him where he was going. And he said, well, my first stop is Washington, D.C. And I said, oh, well, then you're in luck because that's where I'm going. And so I said, where do you plan to stay? And he said, well, I thought I would just roll out my sleeping bag on the, the mall outside the Capitol because it's public property, right? So I'm just going to take my little space of that. And I said, uh, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> um, so I found him a place where he could uh, camp and not get into trouble. Um, the, pro the, the problem with, with common property is oftentimes it is unrestricted, okay? Unrestricted prop uh, common property is property owned in common, which means not actually owned by anybody, where there are no rules about how it can or cannot be used. So natural resources like water and air used to be unrestricted common property. No one owned the Rappahannock River, right? Um, so, so firms don't pollute because they are evil. Firms pollute because it's a rational thing for them to do because it reduces their costs and maximizes their profits given what's legal. Okay, so so one of the solution, the solution that we've been pursuing about, um, about common property resources like environmental resources um, is we've been putting restrictions on them, right? You're not allowed to dump stuff in the river anymore, at, le at least not, not uh, some stuff. Um, you know, air pollution. Um, if you've been up to Skyline Drive, you've seen the effects of acid rain on the trees up there. Do you know where that problem, you know where that acid rain comes from? Do you see? No. It comes from power companies in Ohio and Indiana and other parts of the Midwest because they use high sulfur coal to generate electricity because it's cheaper. And originally what happened was they would, um, you know, they had little smokestacks, but then the problem with those little smokestacks is the pollu their own neighborhoods got polluted with ash and chemicals and things like that. So they said, well, this, is, this doesn't work for us. So what they did is they added really tall smokestacks. And so the, the pollution, gets up high enough to get into the atmosphere where the prevailing winds go west to east in this country. And then uh, with, uh, with sulfur coal, high sulfur coal, that turns into sulfuric acid, diluted sulfuric acid, which is the acid rain that we get from them. Okay, Europe 
has similar problems and they come from the northeastern part of the US. Okay. You know, who owns the air? Nobody. Um, so just one more point. Um, since the problem with environment, since environmental problems are due to spillovers, the best way to deal with a particular environmental problem is at the level of government that covers both the polluter and the people downstream. Okay, so for example, um, you may recall that the Clean Air and the Clean Water Acts both were passed in 1970. Some of you may not remember that. Um, some of us are old enough. Um, and that actually, the, the, they together created the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, before that time, there was only one state that had rivers that were fishable and swimmable, which is a standard, a, a, a standard for, for how clean the water is. It's both fishable um, and swimmable. Okay, what state do you think that was? Not Ohio. No, um, it was actually the state of Maine. Why do you suppose they were able to clean up their rivers? Cold. No, the answer is, I believe they're the only state where all of their rivers are entirely within the state. So at the state government level, they could say, hey, this is a problem, we need to fix it, right? Whereas anyone along the Mississippi River, any state along the Mississippi River, um, they're not large enough to, 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 um, to cover the whole problem, basically, right? You know, um, anyway. Uh, Fun fact, I actually was hired at Mary Washington to teach environmental economics, though I haven't done it in a long time. Um, but, uh, so I do know something about this stuff. Okay, um, that's all I wanted to cover this week, but let me see if you guys have any questions about anything. I have a question about what we just were discussing. Sure. For the example, when you were talking about pollution from Northeast America that is able to affect Europe, mm -hmm. what would be the covering body that would be able to deal with well, that? Well, that's the problem, is, is it would require an international body, right? Mm -hmm. what, what do we gain by reducing our pollution in Europe? Happier Europeans? Well, certainly we do, right, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. it is the right thing to do, and presumably, um, you know, we would gain the same thing that Virginians gain when, when power companies in the Midwest reduce their air pollution, right? But, but you raise a really important point. That's why international environmental problems are so much harder to, to deal with. Another issue... For the, uh Sorry, another, okay. another issue, kind of a related issue, um, is environmental protection is kind of a luxury good. Um, poor countries can't really afford it. You know, they have to buy the high sulfur coal because that's all they can afford, right? So they're likely to end up with more pollution problems than, than <clears throat> we do. Anyway, uh, Andrew, you're going to say something? Yeah, for the, um, for the final, is it going to be um, divvied up evenly with all the modules or there's going to be more emphasis on the stuff since the second exam? Um, more emphasis on the stuff since the second exam. Um, about half the final is stuff since the second exam, um, but we'll talk more about that in detail next week. And is that, sorry, I know you said more, is it going to be similar in setup to the first two yeah, exams? Yeah, it's going to be 60 multiple choice questions. Is there going to be a time limit? Yes. Um, yes, but it shouldn't affect anybody. Um, you know, it most, nearly everybody gets done within two hours. Um, if you need more than that, um, you're welcome to take it. 
but you, you might have already said this and I might have missed it because I was late, but uh, is there a certain time frame that we have on Thursday, like between a certain amount of hours? Yes. Uh, well, there will be. Um, basically, nine to five. Okay. Um, but I already have the morning covered, so if you could do it in the morning, that would be better for me. If you can't, I'll work it out. What about like <clears throat> using calculators and all that stuff? Yeah. Can we can we use it for the test? Because like my you know like, my, like but it's my phone. So yeah. Like, so. Okay. Well, I was just making sure because I know some people. You no, know, I know. I mean, uh, you know, I know. I mean, I think I think that's a dumb question, but I completely understand why you guys have to ask it. You know, I mean, why? Yes, use a calculator. Okay. You know, if I'm there, I'll work. If I'm there, I may mock you because I try to make the math doable in your head. But but that's okay. You can use the calculator. And then I had a question to the last module. Um, I was when I did the test, they were talking about the market based versus the command. Yes. Can you kind of explain that a little bit, sure. the differences? Sure. Um, okay, there's, there's two basic approaches to pollution abatement. There are regulatory standards and there are economic incentives. Regulatory standards are basically a quantity, like a quota. You can, they tell the firms, you can pollute no more than X amount. As long as you're under X, you're cool. If you go over X, then you get into trouble. Okay. Economic incentives are kind of like economic judo. Um, <laughs> what we do is we, we get, we change the environment so firms end up doing what we want them to do, which is pollute less. Okay, let me give you an example. Suppose, suppose we said, you can pollute as much as you want, but for every ton that you pollute, you have to pay $100 or $1,000 or whatever it is, right? Now, ideally, that charge would, would be the difference between the marginal social cost and the marginal private cost. So what we're doing is we're, we're making the externality go away. It's called internalizing the externality. Because then the marginal private costs literally jumps by the amount of the marginal social cost. So, so to pollute, there's an actual cost, of, you know, what it costs to generate the pollution. And then beyond that, there's the charge, right? From the firm's point of view, it's just money, right? So since their cost of polluting has gone up, even though we're allowing them to pollute, it's gonna be in their best interest to pollute less. So it's using economic incentives to get what we want in terms of the result. Makes sense. Of course it does, it's economics. <laughs> Other questions? This might be totally off subject, but are you aware that in Iceland, it's, uh, if the land is not publicly owned, you can, everybody has pu 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 uh, public access to it. You can camp on, like the mall example, in Iceland, you can camp anywhere. That's no, not private. No, that, that's interesting. I was just wondering if you had yeah. any insight onto whether it's, it's abused or not. The land is abused, like um, in the comments? That's a great question, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that there's a, a whole lot of land and very, very few people in Iceland. So it may be that the land is so abundant that there aren't enough people to cause a problem. Good question, though. William, you, you look like you're in witness protection program. It's terrible. I've been turning on and off the lights to try to make it work, but I just can't. <laughs> That's okay. It's like a 60 minutes interview where you can't see the, the person. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? I've got a really spicy curry to make tonight. Ooh. Oh, which building is the econ house? Ooh, that's an important question, isn't it? Yeah, kind of. 
I because you always talk about it, but I don't know which one it is. I don't know. Is it the maybe, one on the corner maybe. that they bought that's across the street from Mary Wash? It is across the street. Yeah. Um, if you go to my contact information, Sam. It's on there. There's a map. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, we are quote off campus unquote. That's like, is it one thousand four? It's ten. It's a yeah. It's ten oh four College Ave. Okay. Yeah, it's the second house down from William Street. Okay. Not the McMansion, the one next door. Darlene, I'm surprised you can keep a straight face here. Other questions. All right, well, let's call it a wrap then.